Thank you. Thank you so much. For those of you who are at home, uh, I know you can't see this because it's being live streamed, but 15,000 people just stood up and cheered for me. So thank you. I know you can see that. Uh, thank you so much for you, Cap, for having me come back this year. I thought after last year, they're like, there's no way he's coming back. Uh, but I did. I told him I had one. Where should I put this? Uh, I told him I had one request. I'm like, I'll do it, but only if Elder Holland opens for me. If, you don't, if he's not doing it, forget it. I'm not going to do it. So thank you, Elder Holland. Are my slides working here? Let's throw those slides up here. I got to shave. Are these working? Where are we? Oh, they're behind me. Okay. I can't see them. I'm going to kind of step over here. Can you follow me? Are we good? If I go over here. Uh, so uh, welcome, people of George the Saint and people on the Internet. Uh, my name is Colin uh, with two L's because my mother loves me. Uh, and again, thank you, Elder Holland, for uh, being willing. He called me last night. He was so nervous. He's like, Colin, I, I'm just really worried about going before you. I'm like, it's going to be okay. Uh, and, and we were talking on the way up. Uh, in fact, he's calling me right now. Hold on. Sorry about this. What's up, man? No, you did a good job. It was good. I thought your salt joke killed it. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't think you rushed it at all. And your hair looked great, so... See you later, Jeff. All right. Uh, welcome to this. <laughs> if you're an adult and you're a parent, raise your hand. Where are my adults at? Where are your parents, grandparents? Go ahead and stand up for, uh, for me real quick. Go ahead and stand up. I know your butts are falling asleep, but go ahead and stand up. If you're at home, go ahead and stand up too. I need you to raise your right hand or put up to uh, your kidney, your heart. I need you to say, not, not in the air, just like somewhere on an organ here, and repeat my pledge. Ready, go with your name. I call and do solemnly swear that I will not go straight home tonight after this meeting and chuck my kid's phone into Sand Hollow or throw their iPad in a volcano. Go ahead, sit down. Thank you for doing that. When I'm done talking, there's my slides. When I'm done talking, parents, you're all going to want to do that. You're not going to do that, though. Don't do anything like that. Not, not for at least a few weeks. Please don't do this. Last time I was here speaking in Hurricane, uh, a lady sent this to me. She's like, Colin, I went straight home after your speech, and I did this. Please don't do this. I hereby denounce the effects Doggy. that social media Doggy. have on my children. That's just Parawan. Their disobedience and their disrespect. Charlie. Those are her kids' iPhones. Those were her kids' iPhones. Yeah. Uh, yeah, round of applause for that woman, yes. <laughs> All right, just keep my slides up here. Is that going to be okay? So I don't keep taco necking here. Uh, so I started a movement called Save the Kids, uh, uh, which was just a, uh, a thing I started on Instagram. Why not? Put it where it is, right? Fight fire with fire, uh, which has now become a, a big movement going all over the country sharing this message. Before COVID, I was speaking 30 to 90 times a month. After COVID, I gained 20 pounds and started podcasting. So uh, it's not a big deal. But it's great to be here with you guys. The kids in the country call me the black angel of iPhone death which I love. It is now tattooed on my lower back in henna ink. Uh, last time I spoke in a place like this uh, was in uh, Utah State. Any Aggies? Do we have Aggies here? Yeah. <laughs> no one cares. It's OK. Any true Aggies? Where are my true Aggies at? There we go. That means they made out with someone on a rock freshman year. So uh, I spoke there, and all the middle schools knew I was coming. And they're like, oh, we heard you're coming. Someone sent this to me. He's like, this meme's going around all of Logan right now. I'm like, yes, I've become an internet meme. Uh, but my own ward hates me. Some of you have heard of this before because I started doing this two and a half years ago. Uh, it, my ward hates me. My church uh, hates me, which is weird uh, because I thought we love each other. Uh, because one day at church, I saw everyone on their phones, and I turned my uh, phone on. I changed the name to Jesus, and I turned on AirDrop. And everyone who was on their phones, when they should be paying attention, suddenly goes, but Jesus would like to send you this photo. And every phone goes away. <laughs> the church attendance and uh, participation is 107%. No. But I love what I do because I get messages from kids all day like this one. I have tons of these. Uh, Colin, you came and spoke at Logan today, and I want to tell you how much you helped me. Kids, if you're a kid, raise your hand. Uh, how many of you literally were dragged to come here? Like they dragged you out of bed. Okay, come sit in the front row, and I'll stare at you the whole time. Soon. Today, uh, I want to tell you how much you helped me. Today, I was planning on ending my life when uh, my family went to your fireside. 
when I heard, uh, my mom dragged me into the car to make me come, but when I heard what he talked about, I realized so many things, specifically that social media has had a huge negative impact on my life. And I've decided to get rid of it for good. Thank you for what you said and for saving my life. Awkward segue. All right. So, 2020. Get it? Yeah. Uh, what a year has 2020 been? Anyone else feel like the writers, whoever wrote the script, have gone insane? Hurricane Utah we had this week. Fires, earthquakes, protests. And they're like, what about murder hornets? We're like, throw it on the list. Giant four-foot murder hornets. It's going crazy. This little tiny Cheeto dust brought this entire world to its knees. And if you want to remember the little gross thing Jeff Holland showed of the and like all that nastiness, we're like, yeah, it's fun talking to you with your mask on. I feel like I'm speaking to a bunch of creepy nurses. But it was so serious that it, everything stopped. And everyone together, for most of us, uh, changed things really, really quickly, right? We started wearing masks. We started changing. No one could go anywhere. Everything shut down. Because it was such a big deal, we all decided we got to make changes. Really big changes, right? <laughs> Which one of you bought all the Costco at the Walmart off the boulevard here? Where? Jeez. 190,000 people are dead, schools shut down, churches shut down, business shut down, lives are impacted forever because this little Cheeto dust. Uh, but can we talk now about the real virus? And that's why we're here. The real virus affecting uh, families in America is the Kardashians. No, not them. Did you guys know they're getting canceled this week? So the world is literally healing itself. Isn't this amazing? Yay! Planet Earth is healing. That's one of the biggest viruses, but bigger than that is this virus. Uh, and we've been in a pandemic for a long time. This didn't start March 15th. This pandemic's been going on for a long, long time, affecting a lot of people, killing hearts of millions, destroying countless marriages. I get messages every day from women in tears that say, gosh, this destroyed my whole family. You know, now I got to talk to my kids and say why dad's not around anymore or why we're in divorce court and... Destroying marriages, it's stealing the innocence of children, it's fueling a pandemic of sex trafficking, and we're fighting a monster here, and it's called porn. So let me share with you a little bit, and for the kids here, you know what I'm talking about, don't play dumb, right? I go talk to schools all over the country, and let me share with you a little about what's happening with this pandemic here. Whenever I do assemblies, I hand out these note cards, I ask the kids, I say, hey, fill in the blank, one thing my parents don't know about social media is what? Uh, I'm going to put this down here. Is what? And they say things like, oh, there's this, there's that, there's Snapchat, this. My parents have no idea about this stuff. Or they say, my parents are blocked, so they don't have a clue. Uh, so many times, kids in an elementary school, bad stuff is easy to find. There's a ton of porn. Nudes, 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 porn everywhere. This is happening. And what I'm seeing is that porn and watching has become so normalized in our schools today. Let me show you some actual messages I've got from people. A message I got from a mom. She said, why is my seventh grade daughter come home after school crying because boys are watching Pornhub during lunch and all commenting on it at lunch? Why are phones still out at school? I got this message from a seventh grade girl. She said, oh, a boy asked me this. He said, can you just send me a pic? Come on, send me a pic of yourself. Send me a nude pic. And I said, can't you just watch porn? And he goes, oh, it's not the same. Leave me alone. Oh, you're a B. And it's become so normalized that now kids are playing theme songs of these websites. <laughs> at their class basketball games that people are freaking out about it. And if you go on apps like TikTok or Likey or Snapchat or Instagram, and for the girls who know who I'm talking about and the guys there, kids are being hypersexualized at such young ages. Six, seven-year-old kids up there dancing in crop tops, throwing it back on TikTok, putting it on the internet for everyone to see. And where are these kids' parents? Right there. 47% of the internet is on pornographic, pornographic consumption. Eight billion hours of porn watched a year on one site? And what is this doing? This is leading to a huge problem and a big increase on peer on peer sexual abuse happening younger and younger. And it's happening, happening in this community, it's happening everywhere. A message I got from a 15 year old girl in Montana I was sexually assaulted by a guy friend after an early morning class. He told me later he watches a lot of porn and thought, I would like that. So obviously it's messing with people's heads and thinking, oh, this is what's normal, and it's so not normal. One-fourth of teens in America are now sexting, starting in age seventh grade on average. A fourth 
Here's a message I got from another mom. She actually sent me the message, the Snapchat DMs from a kid. I just checked my 14-year-old son's phone, and a a girl at school was trying to get his attention one morning. Why are you not replying? He said, I don't feel good. She sent him a nude pic, 14 years old. Does this make you feel better? Here's a message I got from a middle school, Box Elder Middle School up north. Uh, She said, Connie, you just spoke at our school a while ago. Uh, Well, skip down. When I was 13, guys here started asking me for nude pics, and I didn't want to, but I sent him any raise. Uh, Why? Because his reaction made me feel like I had a great body, but it was temporary. Within a month, I was back to hating my body. Pretty soon, another guy asked me for news, and another, and another, and I kept going. Each time they all said that my body's perfect and I was so underrated, I actually started believing them. It never crossed my mind they might be using me. What they said about me made me feel so good. It was like I was addicted to their reactions. Social media has portrayed an image that brainwashed me into thinking that's exactly what I had to be. I did things I never thought I would just so I could feel like I'd reached that goal. And I love how she says here in the middle of that first paragraph, it was ruining me, and it was all because I was trying so hard to reach this crazy image that I saw every day, where? (laughs) On Instagram. We have a child's extortion crisis in Utah. And if you don't believe me, every day, just check the news. Almost every day, there's articles with photos of people that look like us, that came from good homes, that because of their problems, struggle with uh, viewing pornography at young ages, are then taking it to the next level, trying to extort kids on social media, trying to go through apps like Snapchat and TikTok and all the ones that our kids use. Some of these kids went, uh, became, uh, were really good kids growing up and never thought they'd be here, but they are. So let's uh, talk about how drug industry works for a second, shall we? From my massive knowledge of watching several drug documentaries. <laughs> Uh, drug production, right? Okay, so to, uh, for the drug industry to work, there's got to be a drug produced. So down in Colombia, right, if it's cocaine, someone's chopping a bunch of coca leaves and turning it into a paste. They're getting the drug ready. There's a ton of different drug types, right? There's ones that you can shoot up. There's ones you can swallow. There's ones you can snort. Tons of different drugs to give you that hit. Then there's got to be a drug in, uh, injection device, a way to get that drug into your system, a way to access that drug. Then there's got to be a scary place to go get the drug, right? Uh, Maybe in some dark alley or maybe behind a Chipotle somewhere. (laughs) Then there's less scary places to get drugs, like a shady doctor, like Dr. Leo Spichemin from 30 Rock. But there's always got to be a consumer, someone who's putting that drug into their body. And none of this would happen. None of this could continue. The drug chain would stop if there wasn't someone to give the consumer the drug, to provide them with what they're looking for. So let's talk about one of the most addictive drugs. I'm so glad that we watched part of that documentary to see how addictive this drug is. If you compare side by side someone shooting up heroin to someone looking at porn, it's almost identical. But the porn lasts actually a little bit longer. So there's got to be production, and that's what's getting produced like crazy. 30,000 porn videos produced for every one to two actual feature films in Hollywood. And the drug types, of course, porn. And the drug injection devices, right there. Phones, iPads, Xboxes, books, doesn't matter. This is the way that the drugs are getting into our system. And then there's the very dark, scary places to find access to drugs are the very big porn sites directly. But here's where most people are getting it. The very less scary places, the the apps that mom and dad use too. Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, Netflix, Reddit, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, Audible. Yeah, Audible. I've had kids tell me, oh, I was listening to it on Audible. And then there's got to be a consumer, right? Why is there demand? Because there's a lot of consumers. And right now, this is our consumer. Is a kid sitting in their room, bored, looking for some attention with a blanket over their head, looking at a screen. And none of this works if there isn't someone who's going to purchase and provide and enable. And sadly, right now, that's us. Parents, we are the ones who are providing this. We're the ones paying for the devices, And a lot of our kids know this isn't just silly dances. This isn't just TikTok where they're summoning demons from the underworld or fighting away bees, whatever you're doing on TikTok. Uh, We're handing kids devices and we're saying, here's a Playboy, but the most intense Playboy you've ever seen, don't look at it. That is how my dad taught me about pornography. (laughs) He goes, Colin, there's a monster in a box under your bed. Don't look at that. And then he walked off and I was 12 and I was like, wait, what? What does this monster look like? And I got bit. So if you're going to give your kids a device with access to the internet or those apps I just showed you, that's the percent that are going to see it. That's the percent they're going to get hit. 
And parents, you remember, I'm an 80s kid. You remember how hard it was to find this stuff when you were growing up? You had to like go to Vegas and like look on the ground and pick up flyers. I'll tell you the story how I got bit by this snake. I was seven years old. Uh, and there was one kid in my class who had a ponytail. And he had an older brother with a longer ponytail. And a dad with the longest ponytails. And we went to their house one day. I don't know why. And he said, hey, get on your bike. We're going to ride our bikes up a hill. And we went up a hill and we went to this like backwood area. And then we climbed an even sketchier tree to a sketchier uh, like, uh, tree house. And then the sketchiest brother with the longer ponytail opened up a box. And in that box was a magazine that blew my mind. And it was a JCPenney catalog. It wasn't even the good stuff. And now they can get it everywhere. Instagram, last year, was the number one place kids found porn. One of the top, as far as social media apps. That's where they're finding it. I don't know if anyone's noticed in the last month what Instagram has done to their Discover page. Has anyone noticed what they've done in the last month? If you have Instagram, your whole Discover page has changed the last four, 30 days. It is all little kids and little girls and people in bikinis dancing now. That's all it is now. Snapchat, oof. An app that was created, which when it was created, it was called Peekaboo. Then they changed it to Snapchat. And they put funny filters on there to convince parents, like, it's okay, it's just for funny filters, right? When in fact, it's not even, this app is horrible. Snapchat is the devil. This app was created to do this. And if Snapchat is the devil, TikTok is the great and spacious building. For those of you I'm talking about, come dance with us. I can't wait. It is destroying people. If you have this app, kids, please chuck it in the garbage where it belongs. Oh, yeah, thank you. Throw it away. <laughs> I cannot tell you parents. Well, actually, I can show you. I have an account that's private on Instagram called save.the.parents where I show parents. You have to be, I accept only parents, where I show you the stuff I find on TikTok. And parents best be back there like, I just threw up. How is this possible? This app's rated 12 plus. Twitter, you can stream. You can watch full porn on Twitter. YouTube, I got two messages yesterday from moms. Both 12, 11, 11 year and 12 year old boys, their sons who got the school issued Chromebook down in Vegas with no filters, were both looking at, 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 quote, the most ridiculous, disgusting porn ever through YouTube. Reddit, I've had high school boys tell me. That's how I found it. Pinterest, oh, I'm looking for ideas to pin on a board. There's porn on there too. Amazon, yes, I've had kids tell me they could go on Amazon and look up, search up products and you can find stuff that can spark and trigger something. Roblox, I've seen. <sighs> Where kids are stumbling into rooms and Roblox games where no one's got clothes on and bad things are happening. So understand this, that parents, the internet is anxious to show your kids porn. It's anxious. They type in one word on a Google search and Google's like, do you mean porn? Mike Lee said that these apps, they act like popular strip clubs for kids now. And from the National Center on Sex Exploitation, they said that the most dangerous neighborhood in America right now, it's not in the dark alleyways at 3 a.m., it's in your own house, in their bedroom online. So why are kids hiring porn? I talked to the kids. Why are kids hiring porn? Just like they would go and go get a tool at Home Depot because they need that tool to do something for them. Why are they hiring porn? It's because it's everywhere and no one is talking about it to them. They see their friends talk about TikTok. They go to their friend's house and see it on iPad, and no one talks to them about it. Do we have any family or friends that are from New Zealand? Any people from New Zealand? Any Kiwis? No? So diverse in southern Utah. Oh, we got one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, New Zealand just launched this amazing uh, PSA about pornography and why kids are going and looking and searching it out. And I've kind of uh, clipped it a little bit here. Hi, yeah. I'm Sue. This is Derek. We're here because your son just looked us up online, you know, to watch us. Matt! Matt, darling, there's some people here to see you. So he watches you online? Yeah, you know, on his laptop. iPad, PlayStation. Mm, his phone, your phone. Smart TV projector. Yeah, anyway, we usually perform for adults, but your son's just a kid. He might not know how relationships actually work. We don't even talk about consent, do we? Now we just get straight to it. Yeah, and I'd never act like that in real life. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Maddie. You're right. Okay, Sandra, stay calm. You know what to do here. All right, Maddie. It sounds like it's time to have a talk about the difference between what you see online and real life relationships. No judgment. Many young Kiwis are using porn to learn about sex. Did you see how the mom reacted? 
That is how you have to react today. She didn't freak out. She didn't scream. She didn't throw his laptop at a volcano. Whew. Calm down, Sarah. You know, Sandra, you know what to do. Let's go talk about this. Now, I am so happy because when they asked me to come speak, and they're like, hey, will you come talk about this issue? I said, yeah, um, but I'm not the expert here. I think that a lot of times we're asking the wrong people about this stuff. I, uh, when I go out and travel, I have the best opportunity to sometimes meet some amazing kids. And I reached out to three of them, and I said, hey, I'm going to go down to St. George. You guys want to carpool down? Would you come tell your story for a few minutes each to talk about this and, and how you've dealt with some of this stuff? And they came down here with me, and I'm really excited for them to each share a few minutes uh, to talk about different blind spots, parents, that you're missing in parenting. Blind spot number one. I have parents a lot. Oh, I put filters on my kid's device or on their phone, so it's fine. I put a filter on it, and it's fine. They're never going to see porn. Uh, it did my job for me. It's no big deal. Uh, I met this six-year-old kid here a few weeks ago named Smith from uh, Kaysville, North Salt Lake, who messaged me after I spoke somewhere about where he lives, and he told me his amazing story. And I asked Smith, would you come down to St. George and just share a few minutes about your story? So please welcome the stage, all the way from Bountiful, Smith Alley. Come here, Smith. Thank you. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, I want to start out how I want to talk with the question. And that is, what is the world's most valuable connection? What's the most uh, valuable thing in the world? What's the strongest thing in the world? And that's all connection, pure love. For a long time, I lacked connection in my life. For a long time, I didn't have that love in my life. And so I want to tell you my story. I was first exposed to pornography at around nine years old, and it planted a seed for me that quickly became the way that I coped with feelings like boredom, stress, loneliness. And for me, um, it ruined every other relationship that I had. It ruined the way that I connected with my family. At an early age of 13, I had given up um, at that age of 13, I was watching porn three to four times a day. <laughs> my parents and my family would tell you that I was the worst brother, the worst child, the worst son to live with. Raise your hand, parents, if you've got a child that you're struggling a little bit with, you know, going through that teenage phase. Anybody have a kid like that? I know you all do. <laughs> and so, at this time in my life where... Um, I felt no connection. I felt no love from my friends, my family. I felt like I had no one who loved me. I felt like my family didn't care. And I felt like my God had abandoned me. And so, through a series of fortunate events, my parents caught me. And I always thank the heavens that they did. Um, I know that I would never have had the courage and the humility to tell them what, what, what I was involved in. I never would have known at that point the impact that my parents were going to have on me. My dad is an amazing example of how someone has turned their life around and my mom was always there for me throughout my battles. I remember just recently my mom told me about nights where she'd go into her room and she said to herself, I love my son, but I do not like that kid out there. And so, at a super young age of 14 years old, I had a choice to make. And that was either that I was going to pick myself up, that I was going to fight for my life, and that I was going to become the person who I wanted to become, or I was going to feel sorry for myself, I was going to continue in the ways that I had made a habit of. Um, and so one night my mom came and talked to me and she grabbed me by the face and she said, Smith, I will never stop fighting for you, but you have to fight for yourself first. This is when I decided. This is when I decided that I was going to fight. This is when I decided that I was going to change my life. This is when I decided that I was going to be a person who can help other people because I know and I saw as a kid everybody at school who was struggling. My dad always jokes with me. You know, we joke around, but it's really true. He says 95% of boys 
are watching pornography, and the other 5%, they're lying. Um, and so I was able to join an amazing program called Sons of Helaman, a program for boys who are struggling with pornography, and I was able to regain these tools on how I was going to reconstruct my life and how I was going to um, come closer to my God again and how I was going to build myself up and be able to help people. Through all of this, through meeting with other young men who were struggling with the same things that I was, I fell in love with helping people. And this first started when I met one of my best friends, Landon. I met Landon at EFY. It's a summer camp for church youth. And um, the first night I was there, I decided that I was going to share my story, my struggles with pornography and social media with the boys in my dorm. And so I told them about that. And the second night, Landon came to me, someone who I'd just met two days before, and he said that he was struggling with a lot of the same things that I'd been struggling with. He told me that he felt horrible about himself, that he struggled daily with self-worth. And he, he asked me, he asked me to help him lock down his phone because as all kids do, he found ways around the restrictions that his parents put into place. They were not enough. After this, I kept helping other young men, um, my lacrosse team, anyone who I could talk to, I was talking to them about my experiences, my story with pornography, because I know that every single one of them were struggling. And when I decided that I was going to do my Eagle Scout project, I wanted to make it something meaningful, something that I cared about. And so I put on a fireside um, about pornography and the harmful effects, and over 200 people attended. I was shocked, and I fell in love with speaking, and I had plans to do a high school assembly and some other firesides, and those all got canceled due to COVID-19. And so I decided that I would quit my job at Chick-fil-A. I'd been working there for two and a half years. I was a manager at 16 years old. Um, and I quit my job to start a company called Protect. Protect is a company where I go and I talk to families about the harmful effects of pornography and social media, um, which can be very effectful coming from someone who's 16 years old. I talk to these kids that I know how they feel. I know that Social media is ruining their lives, and I know how dark they feel inside. I know that every kid, every high schooler wishes that they could get off social media. They wish that they could delete Snapchat, Instagram, um, TikTok, but they all tell me one thing. They say, I'm too scared. And so I go to families' houses, and I talk to these kids. I talk to the families, and then I help parents set up um, parental restrictions on phones, help them know what Wi-Fi routers to use, help them know how to make sure they know what their kids are viewing on their laptops that we all are using at, at home school. Um, and through this process, I met Colin, and I've been able to work with him a lot. I want to tell you why I started this business, and it's not it's not for any reason besides I know that every family needs it. And this is why. Parents, I know that you'd like to think that your kids are not susceptible to the effects of pornography. I know that you'd like to think that your kids live in a world where they don't have to deal with this stuff. And I know that you'd like to think that your kids are the 1% who haven't been exposed to pornography. But I'll tell you right now, that's not how it is. Your kids are struggling and then you need to protect them. Pornography is a horrible thing. It'll lead people down a path of isolation. Um, users create, crave more hardcore content to, stimu to, to get the same amount of stimulus to the brain. And so it leads down a path to eventually child pornography, prostitution, child sex slavery, and eventually jail. So if you're not yet set on what pornography leads to, there's just a few things um, you might want to avoid. <laughs> Social media leads to comparison. There's nothing worse than being a teenager who already doesn't know who they are or, you know, who they want to be. A teenager who doesn't feel, in, fit, feel like they fit in. 
There's nothing worse than feeling that way and then getting on an app where you see people who you feel are perfect and then feel horrible about yourself. The bottom line is people need connection. So take a moment to get off your phone, get away from your screens, and go connect with someone. Go give somebody an eight second hug. Because the bottom line is when you can get off your phone, when you can start spending less time on social media, on those screens, that's when you can become the person you want to be. So dream a big dream and live life bigger. Thank you, Smith. Uh, Smith came down here earlier yesterday to where city? Hurricane? Or that's tomorrow? Richfield. Uh, to go meet with a group of people. It was just one family that, could you come talk to our kids? And then he went there and the entire neighborhood came. All 13 people who live in Richfield <laughs> came. Blind spot number two real quick. Let's go through this quickly. Uh, is this. Is only boys struggle with porn? Or it's a boy thing or it's a guy thing. And, and girls, it's, it's not a big deal for them. Uh, I met this next person after she reached out to me, as most kids do, and said, hey, I want to show you my story. And I said, why don't you come down and share it in front of a lot of people instead? So uh, all the way up from Bluffdale, Ashley, come on up. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Ashley, and I'm so grateful to be able to come speak to you all today. Um, I'm just going to start off with my story. I am so blessed to be able to be raised in an amazing family of eight kids and two amazing parents. And um, I was homeschooled till seventh grade, and I was thriving. Um, you could also call me the perfect child. <laughs> I, I came across the concept of pornography when I was 11 years old in a book. It was a really good book about how kids found their life being sucked into pornography, but they found a way out. And me just being the little curious girl that I was, I was intrigued by the concept of porn. And um, that only got worse when we moved from our comfortable place and um, set off a new life. We were in a big remodel, and I joined a school for my first time, and of course, I was handed a smartphone. Right after that, I got social media, um, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, and all the other things. <laughs> and of course, I came across porn, and it, that just started my addiction. I was, I would turn to it multiple times a day, every day for six years. Um, that got really, that was really hard on me, especially with school. I couldn't do very well in school. Um, I had to be homeschooled sometimes, but I couldn't tell anyone why. Um, my family didn't even know. Um, but deep inside, that was my deep secret, and I couldn't tell anyone. I was scared. Um, so after years of living the second life, I just wanted to make a change. I was so sick of it. I kept writing notes. I wanted to talk to my parents. I wanted to talk to my bishop. I wanted to get this over with and open up about it. Um, but of course, I was too scared. I was so blessed to come. I had an opportunity to talk to my cousin. And we both opened up, finally. And together, we dealt with our addictions. And um, I have never felt God's love so strongly in my entire life. Um, I wish I could say that um, I wasn't affected by porn anymore. But that's not the case. Just being on social media and seeing all of the models every single day that really, really hurt my body image and confidence. I was affected and it led to my binge eating disorder because I was dieting to always look like the models I saw on my phone. That lasted for nine months. 
And I am happy to say that that is over with now and I'm in a way healthier place now. Um, so parents, parents, please understand that pornography addiction can happen to any child, including yours. Um, if you get anything from what I'm trying to say, please let it be these two things. Number one, don't give your kids a smartphone. As Colin Karsner wisely says, like, I know you don't want your kids to feel left out, and there are good reasons for a phone, but wait till it's the right time when you can monitor it. And yes, I'm saying you, not just throw on some filters and put your head in the sand. Um, it's just such a dangerous world, and kids are so sus suspective, sus What's the word? Susceptible. There you go. Thank you. Um, and we're so vulnerable, and it's not worth just handing it over to them. Number two, we need to have more connection, um, and we need to have more continuous conversations. I had the talk when I was 12 years old, but it was just one time, and I had questions I wanted answered. And of course, where do kids turn to? They turn to technology, they turn to their friends, which sometimes are not the best places to go. Um, I wish that we had more conversations with my family. That really would have helped a lot. Now to the youth. Please know that you are not alone. There are so many people struggling with this. Um, I want to share a couple of my tips that really helped me get over my addiction. Number one, there is power when you open up. Addiction is such a shameful thing, especially for girls. Um, I'm gonna go off on this tangent for a second. Girls are not, pornography addiction is not being addressed with girls. Um, it creates so much shame. We just start not talking about it, and I wish we would more. So open up, talk to an adult, talk to your best friend, and you'd be surprised by how much lighter you feel. Number two, um, when you have an addiction, there's so much energy being put into it. You're focused so much on this life that is consuming you, and I would recommend trying to not focus on it so much. I'm sure a lot of people have heard the story about the two wolves inside of you. There's a bad wolf and there's a good wolf. And some people wonder which wolf will win. The answer is whatever wolf you feed. So if you are putting so much energy and all your life into this addiction, even if you're like just focusing so much on recovery, it can sometimes backfire. And I would recommend trying to find your real life. Turn to service. Um, just get out of your head. Number three, um, find something bigger than you. Um, have a big why. And if you're religious, turn to God. He will help you. And number four, this is just an extra tip that I found really helpful, and that is to clean up your phone, clean up their apps, unfollow people that don't make you feel good, um, eliminate all of your triggers, and that will help you stay away from porn or whatever is triggering, triggering you to fall for those addictions. Um, I just wanna say that you are worth it. Your worth is not defined or altered by you viewing pornography, and this, is something that we can all conquer. Go live your life, go dance, go play your favorite sports. Um, get off your phone. Like, what are you waiting for? Thank you. Thank you. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Ashley. One more blind spot. And that is that recovery, uh, I guess we'd reverse it, is a destination. Um, I met this last guy um, when he reached out to me as well. 
There's the one good part of social media. And he said, I, I just, I got to tell you my story. It was so awesome that I actually we found a weird place to go film his story, which I'll show you at the very end and we'll wrap up. Uh, but please welcome uh, my last speaker here, Luke. Come on up, Luke. <laughs> it's uh, so great to be able to be here. I feel really blessed to be able to speak to all of you, all 15,000 of you who are watching. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about my story. You'll see a little bit of that in a minute. Um, but I also wanted to talk about a few mindsets that really, really helped me. Um, I'm using a couple notes here. Uh, pretend it's the teleprompter. It's not. Um, there's a few questions that I had to learn to ask myself um, as I was focusing on recovering and overcoming from my struggle with pornography. Um, the first question that I want to talk about is what? We have to be honest with ourselves. So much of pornography hides in lies and shame and darkness and fear, but we have to address the problem. And that problem is pornography. The next question is when? For so long, I was pushing it off. I remember being 11 years old and thinking, I'll stop when I'm 12. <laughs> and then I remember being 13 and thinking, I'll stop when I'm 14. And I remember being 15 thinking, I'll stop when I'm 16. And the cycle continued. And so we have to be honest about, I'm going to begin recovery now. Because it's not going to be cold turkey. It's not going to be quick and immediate. It's a process. Recovery is not a destination, but a journey. Now I want to ask you all a question, and I want you to think about it for a few seconds. Um, I want you to think about one person who inspires you and one person you love. And they could be the same person, but I want to give you a few seconds just to think about that. So this is important for the third question, and that is why? Why do I want to overcome? Now, many of us have an inspiration who we look up to, and, and often these inspirations are people who've overcome all odds, um, who have defeated some great villain, whether it's you know, a fictional character or maybe it's an athlete. Um, but every single inspiration, every single person who has done something great has a why. Now, that why may be for money, that why may be for something else, but often what we see in the great stories is that that why is for a person or for a higher power. Now, when you think about this inspiration and you think about, you think about why they're doing what they're doing, that probably inspires you to do something with your life. It's the feeling when you watch a great movie and you, and you feel like you want to get up and go and change the world. So, for example, when I was overcoming, when I was focusing on, um, in the beginning, figuring out um, how to break free, there were several things that really, really helped me. The first was I wanted to do it for God. Um, the atonement is everything. That is the greatest why. But more important, using the atonement and learning to use it. Now, the second was for my family, um, and more so my future wife. Um, I didn't want to be suffering and struggling with this for the rest of my life. I want to be able to be free, to be able to love truly. I want to quote Nietzsche really quick, and he says, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. And that is the final question we need to ask ourselves. How are we going to overcome? While I was overcoming, I, I had a few great mentors, um, and I was doing a lot of study um, about the Hebrew versus Greek mindsets. 
Now, we are living in a Western society. Um, this Western society derives its mindset, its way of thinking from the Greek ideology, which is linear in nature. Now, the Hebrew mindset is cyclical or circular in nature. So experts and people who have studied the ancient Israelites, the ancient Hebrews, have come to realize how different their mindset is from ours. In fact, they've come to realize that ancient Israelites may have been unable to have an abstract, abstract thought. So what that means is that theirs was a mindset of doing rather than feeling. So where we might say, um, after I'm convinced to my satisfaction, then I will try doing something. The Hebrew mindset says, as I practice giving my will to God, I will then understand. So what is right ahead and what is the solution to that? So to put it into perspective, Hebrew thinking doesn't just see the tree, they see the seed, the tree, and the fruit that drops to create new life. Um, it's very much cyclical, just as the cycles of the moon or the sun or the seasons. Similarly, we have to learn not to see the mistake or the addiction or the struggle, but to see its cause, its effect, and mo most importantly, the way that we grow from it. Recovery is not linear, as many, as, as many of us who have struggled have probably tried counting the days one by one. I've gone two weeks, mess up, okay, go back to zero in the linear way of thinking. Recovery is cyclical. When we make a mistake, we don't go back to zero because a circle has no starting point. We simply continue and learn, as Elder Holland was saying earlier. You are not the sum of your mistakes but rather the sum of your successes. I think the most important thing is having that paradigm shift, learning from these mistakes and, and growing, because recovery will never be a destination we reach. It's always going to be a journey. And that's why we're here, is to learn and to grow. So I would challenge you, much like Ashley, to be vocal to speak to those around you, because more often than not, you're going to find that almost all of your friends are struggling with the exact same thing that you are. And when we're vocal, we begin to realize the impact that we can truly have on ourselves, on those we love, and on complete strangers. So learn from your mistakes, and we can change the world. I'm so grateful that they were so brave to come do that. Wasn't that awesome? Uh, I'm going to skip through a few more things here. Um, parents, I talk to your kids every day. Well, they message me and they tell me what they're struggling with. Uh, when you find out that your kids are struggling, when you find out that they got bit by the snake, which is that device in their pocket showing them porn, please don't freak out. Please don't freak out because all you do is tell your kids, do a better job hiding it. Um, a message from a boy in Ogden. <laughs> Colin, I'm 14. I've struggled with pornography for two years, and it's, and it's ruining my life. I was brainwashed on social media to think it wasn't that bad, and I hate who I am. Uh, I always feel like I'm in a cloud. I'm not as emotional. I wrote him back. I said, uh, I'm so proud of you for telling me this. Do me a favor. Tell Dad tonight, and then tell me tomorrow what he says. Just say, Dad, I got bit, and I need your help. He wrote me back the next morning at 9.34 in the morning. He said, Colin, when I talked to my dad about it last night, he said I was gross, and he sent me to my room. <sighs> Parents, starting today, when your kid finally says, I got bit, or you, like with Smith, you discover that they got bit, and they tell you, I got bit, step one has got to be this, and I love you. Thank you for being brave enough to tell me you got bit. I was waiting for you to tell me. Step two, what can we do to help? How can we help you? What, are we, what, what should we do? How can we be there for you? Should we take away some of this action and the devices? I mean, what should we do? Um, 
we in our house have something we call a no trouble bubble, where our kids know there's a chair in my wife's and my bedroom, where they, if they ever have a question or see something or, or, or anything happens, they hear something at school and they have questions, they just say, I need to go to the no trouble bubble. And that means it's time to talk about something and we won't shame them. We'll listen to them with no punishment. So how do we protect our kids from this virus? Here's a couple quick tips for parents, a couple quick tips for, ti- uh, for the kids, and then we'll wrap up. Parents, stop being afraid to talk to your kids about this stuff because they're going to learn it somewhere. So why not learn from you and not from TikTok or YouTube? Number two, if your uh, homes have devices or Wi-Fi, uh, and a, uh, get a content filter, a router to block porn coming to the homes. I like Eero, Bark. There's a lot of good ones out there. Number three, teach your kids what to do when they encounter it. Because if you protect them at your house, they might go to a friend's house or a cousin who have iPads and Chromebooks and social media, and they'll be exposed there. So teach them what to do. Next one, if you let your kids have these devices, if you're going to buy them a snake that couldn't bite them, and when you find out they got bit, don't yell at them. Just yell at yourself, right? They already feel bad. Now, some tip for kids real quick. Shame. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but don't label porn as bad. When you do that, your brain fixates on it as, as a threat, which causes obsessive thoughts and greater likelihood that it will be viewed. Number two, habit. This is a habit-based issue. So just think about changing the ritual. If it's in the morning before school, change the ritual. If it's at, at bedtime, change the ritual in the environment. Number three, mindfulness. This is just us trying to numb out on something. So let's figure out what emotion are we trying to numb? And lastly, and I'm sorry that it's STD because no one would remember if it was SDT. Separate, think, and distract. Step away from what's triggering you. Think about your actions you need to take and then do something to relax or distract or be productive. So in conclusion, today is the Wild West. There is no accountability in technology in Silicon Valley. When I see apps like TikTok, Snapchat, uh, that they say are rated 12 plus for my 12-year-old and I see what's on there, There is no accountability. Kids are guinea pigs in this system. It is the Wild West. Listen to people like Simon who say things like this with smart British accents. Parents have to intervene. We have to stop giving our kids free access to social media and and phones at young ages. They are not ready for it. Their minds cannot cope with the dopamine. If you want to buy your kid a phone where they don't have any access to that stuff, uh, go get a Gab phone. Any kids have Gab phones here? Any kids have Gab phones here? Come up afterwards and get one of my awesome Snapchat suck stickers that put on the back of your phone. Sound good? There we go. Uh, we'll skip this one. Go get a, a second hug later. Um, we could do that another time. Uh, I want to wrap up with this video. Luke, when he shared with me his story, I thought it was so powerful that I said, would you meet me in this weird, sketchy basement parking lot and let's film it. Uh, turn it into a poem for me and let's film it. Uh, so we're going to watch this and then we'll wrap up. I remember being 11. I remember wondering if I was the hero or the villain, cause heroes win and villains are addicted. Heroes defeat all the shadows villains live in. Heroes speak, but villains' thoughts are silent. That's what I thought. See, no 11 year old should ever have to choose between their family and the pit they've been digging, or how many weeks or days or hours it's been since they last failed and gave in. No 11 year old should ever have to wonder if their life is worth the living. That's what I thought. That was the lie that it was selling me. That every time I searched it up, I became less human, the enemy. And that lie in all its truth wasn't what the industry kept selling me. And the truth in all its lies wasn't what my addicted 11-year-old brain kept telling me. I remember being 13. I read a book one day with a scary story about scary things, about children killing children. And it got me thinking. How far do we have to fall as a society to be living in this hell? How could they ever make me kill someone that I have never met? Someone who dreams and hopes and fears like me but has to live their life in dread because they are at the mercy of the thoughts up in my head. Yeah, it got me thinking, but not enough. I was still stuck in a fallacy. So I went into my room, locked the door, picked up my phone and made that scary story a reality. Porn kills children. That's what they're selling. They make us think that we're the enemy when they make us the accessory and they take our hearts in revelry. But we aren't the true enemy, it's porn. The biggest industry in the world, because its webs and slimy fingers are entangled in our norms, 1.2 million kids a year are taken and they're sold. And who helps fund it? Porn. And who helps fund that? Us. Children killing children. 
I remember being 15, ready to give up all I knew and what I thought was true just to escape the fear and doubt and shame that I never outgrew. I was still a kid, every day giving my heart to an addiction that would leave me worse every time I'd start. And while it was killing me, what I didn't know is that it was killing more than my dreams and hopes and happiness and the plan God had in store. An evil centerpiece of darkness with a revolver in its pocket and the energy I put in was a bullet chambered cock it with my fear and the finger on the trigger wasn't mine. No, the finger is an industry set on its perfect crime. A double-sided gun with both barrels pointed at children. I remember being 17. I couldn't take it anymore. In a year I'd be an adult wondering what my childhood was for if not porn. It took me nine whole years of darkness to one day reach into my pocket and feel its slimy fingers as I unlocked it. Porn. See, no other drug is clever enough to find its way into three-year-olds' pockets, and no adult is dumb enough to calm their kids with shots of vodka, right? Well, the phones we make a part of us serve well to get that job done. Porn. I didn't realize through all those years of anxiousness and lying that my innocence and happiness weren't the only things dying. No, it's marriages and families and faith and joy, humanity, not to mention all the children trapped who just can't find a way to breathe. We're killing children with the drug that's made to own our lives and tell us we aren't living, it's our pride. And our imperfect action that loads the gun that's pointed at the kids and it's in fashion? No, no more. This ain't love, it's a placebo. And it's time for us to overcome and prove that we're the heroes. Now I'm 18 and I realize what I was missing. For the years I was addicted, I forgot that God was with me. We aren't perfect, we all have pains and sadness. But recovery is not pulling off a bandage or a scab, it's turning outward. Because loneliness is just the lie we're given. Ninety odd percent of people who are living what we're living. And a God and friends and parents who never aren't listening. So though it hurts to overcome and it might just take a minute, I've learned that every single vice does have a virtue if you let it. There's a real connection in this world to be found through all the hardness. There's a flame of truth and love if we're all willing to just spark it and a light that covers up our flaws and shows us through the darkness. And we're all just children, learning to love children. The hero's throne is there if we will fill it. We're just children, learning to love children. And when we love, we lose ourselves and defeat the real villain. We can save the children. Was well, that awesome? Good job, Luke. Very good. For the kids who are here, the hero's throne is waiting for you to fill it. I have seen the rooms that are covered in pads where the children, when they are taken away from sex trafficking, go. They go to these rooms for part of their therapy where they can just bang their fists on the ground and the walls and scream, where they can let it all out. And this industry is what is fueling their nightmare. And these kids need a voice. And you can be their voice. Every time you shut the laptop, you are filling that throne. Every time you turn off your phone, you are filling that throne. Every time you shut off that app, you are filling that throne. You are becoming the hero these kids need. And if that doesn't inspire you to go tell someone today on the way home, text your dad, text your bishop, text a friend, I got bit and I'm ready to be a hero for these kids How do we save the kids? Here are my four. These are my cry-pods. And this world they're growing up in is not what I expected it to be. And we can't prepare the road for our kids. We have to prepare our kids for the road. And the road is dangerous and it's full of potholes. But that's all I care about is them. And I know you parents care so much about your kids too. So please go home and realize this world they're growing up in is not the same that we grew up in. 
It's a lot scarier, but it doesn't have to be something we parent out of fear. They want to be talked to. They want to be connected. They need us to be there for them. They need our eyes on them and not on our own screens. And stop giving kids smartphones. Thanks for coming.